That's probably important. Where's the little... Oh, there's a little red dot there. Cool. Good to know. All right. Um, so specifically in fracture mechanics, the, the only thing we're going to be covering here is, is what's known as linear elastic fracture mechanics. So uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics or LEFM. So this is what I talked about at the very end of the last class um, on Friday is basically when you have some sort of a crack tip um, going to define some directions here x and y uh, and we're looking for the stress now x and y um, at some point away from this thing at some distance r away and some angle theta away from this thing. Um, I had given a general formula for sigma x and sigma y. Actually, I don't know if I actually wrote down the formula for sigma y. Um, but this one was some um, um, kic, or ki, sorry, over the square root of 2 pi r cosine of theta over 2, uh, 1 minus sine theta over 2, sine of 3 theta over 2, sum ki square root 2 pi r over 2, 1 plus sine theta over 2, sine of 3 theta over 2. Um, but the important thing here wasn't necessarily these sines and cosines, this just kind of tells you how the stress varies around the crack tip. The important thing was this 1 over square root of r. So there was actually, when you do this derivation, um, you get some higher order terms. So something on the order of r to the 1 half, um, r to the 3 halves, uh, plus some other stuff, r to the 5 halves and so on. But these terms, as r goes to 0, go to 0. So anything with an r to the 1 half. But anything with an r here, um, as I go close to 0, goes up to infinity. So if I say my, my sigma y, y is proportional to 1 over square root of r, as my r goes to 0, sigma y would go to infinity. But we know that's not exactly practical. So, so our lin linear elastic fracture mechanics derivation pulls out these formulas and, and one for, for the shear stress sigma x, y. But we need to know when this assumption is actually valid. So in order to be able to use this on an engineering scale, we need to say, all right, when, when is this 1 over root r assumption true? Or not true, because it's never technically true, but when is it good enough? Um, and so to do that, what we need to look at is kind of what's actually going on around the tip of a crack. So if I look now at the tip of a crack, uh, and I look at the stress, let's say the stress in the y direction um, near that crack tip, there's some theory would say this goes as a function of 1 over r. Eventually this kind of plateaus out to some small stress. Realistically, that's not going to happen. So I showed this a little bit at the very beginning when we started talking about fracture. But really, I'm, I'm going to hit some, some yield strength where this stress is going to plateau initially. It's not actually going to be, it's not actually going to go up to infinity because inside this zone here, I have some, some plastic zone, some plastic deformation. So that happens out to some distance rp. rp. Um, once I go past that, it'll, my stress will actually kind of toe back down to my 
to my k uh, to my one, square root of one over r solution. So it should follow that mostly up until we get to kind of an external boundary. Let's uh, I don't want to draw this. I'll draw this a little bit more clearly. Uh, let's see this plateaus out and this goes down like that. Um, there we go. So some new distance, um, I'm not going to say a hey, but um, here, this this zone in the middle, I'm going to move this RP over, RP, um, this zone in the middle where our stress field kind of matches this analytical solution, this is what's known as our K annulus. So this is the region where that K field is is valid. Sometimes it's it's referred to as a as a K dominated field. So uh, K dominant region, and then outside of this, uh, this is now dominated by boundary conditions. So this is like if I had a crack in the material. <coughs> There's some plastic zone here, some K dominant zone here, and then eventually my boundary condition starts to dominate my stress. And that free boundary will, will affect the stress state in this area, and it won't follow that one over root R solution anymore. But what I want is for basically this plastic zone to be all relative to my to my k annulus. So in order to say I can use this solution, uh, this linear elastic fracture mechanic solution, and I can pull out the the kic that I that I want, the gc that I want, uh, and I can pull out all those parameters, this solution generally has to be true. So I need to figure out now what this plastic zone is, what the size of this plastic zone is, so that as an engineer, I can design a part, I can know how big I have to make a part to test so that I can get a KIC value out. Um, around a crack, no matter what size that crack is, there's always some stress concentration. There's always some kind of like a hole in a plate. Um, but that stress concentration, the effect it'll have on the sample changes depending on how big it is relative to the sample. So again, we just need, in order to use, again, these uh, linear elastic solutions I need so in order for LFEM to be valid order for L E L E F M L E F M to be valid the plastic zone has to be much smaller than my process zone or than my K annulus So how do we actually figure out how do we actually figure out what the size of that plastic zone is? So what I want to know now is what is my plastic zone size? Plastic zone size. Um, so now I know my my stress here is proportional to ki over square root of 2 pi r, 2 pi r. Um, I can use this, say, take a yield stress, uh, take some stress concentration ki, and figure out what my rp is. My rp now, I'm going to say is, is approximately equal to, if I basically reorganize this and plugged in sigma yield, um, 1 over 2 pi k i um, c over sigma yield squared. Um, so now if I know what my k c, what my critical stress concentration is for a given sample, and what my yield stress is, I can kind of get a, a rough estimate of what my fracture process zone is, uh, of what that plastic zone size is. So. As an example now, I'll, I'll throw in a couple materials that may be useful. So glass, which um, 
again, is, is what all of these, all this kind of fracture theory started with, with Griffith, uh, testing of glass rods. Let's look at glass. So glass, we'll say now this is going to be the theoretical yield strength. So for glass, we're actually ripping apart bonds, atomic bonds in the fracture zone. Um, because remember, the actual strength of glass is dominated by the fracture. Uh, so here, this will be on that order of 10,000 uh, MPa, which is, again, that theoretical glass strength. Glass is never actually this strong. Um, it's only at the atomic scale. Uh, and then my Ki uh, or Kc is something on the order of one MPa square root meter. Um, it varies depending on the exact type of glass, but it's it's somewhere that plus or minus a little bit. So if I plug that in, now my RP, one over two pi, this is 10 to the sixth, so Ki 10 to the sixth over 10 to the ninth, um, or 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 10th, to the tenth squared. Um, so if I plug these values in, I get something that's on the order of 10 to the minus 9 meters. Again, these are just very rough numbers, and I'm rounding a whole bunch. Um, but this is about 1 nanometer. So uh, as a frame of reference, 1 atom, the spacing between atoms is about 3 angstroms, or 0.3 nanometers. So this is about 3 or 4 atoms across. So pretty much, for glass, any sample that I test is going to have a valid fracture process zone. It doesn't matter how big it is, unless I have something that's 10 nanometers across, I can do a fracture test on glass. Uh, and because this fracture process zone is so, so small relative to, um, relative to any size of my sample. If I look instead, say something like ductile steel, or no, sorry, high strength steel first. High strength. High, high strength steel. I have a, sig a yield strength that's on the order of, say, like 1.4 GPA, um, which again is a very high strength for steel, but um, this will be the problem we look at. Or some KC. Uh, is something on the order of 65 MPa root meters. If I plug these in, RP 1 over 2 pi, this is 65 times 10 to the 6th, this is 1.4 times 10 to the 9th squared, 9th. This is something on the order of 0 0.3 millimeters. So now we're getting to something that's a, it's a more reasonable sample size. So in order to do, so now to do, do a valid fracture test, specimen must be, there's not like a hard number here, but something much greater. So we can say like an order of magnitude greater. So something like three millimeters greater than or equal to th three millimeters. So still fairly small. That means if I if I get a normal size test specimen, something on the order of like a centimeter, it's still you know in the right ballpark. It's not something too huge, but um, it's something that I can do a fracture test on with a reasonable size. Now if I did something like a tough seal, so example. Tough steel, something with a slightly y lower yield strength, so something that's on the order of 0 0.35 GPA, and some KC that's now very high, um, and is something on the order of like 180 MPA root meters, RP 1 over 2 pi, uh, 180 10 to the 6th over uh, 
350 times 10 to the 6th squared. This will now give me something that's closer to 4 centimeters. So now 4 centimeters, that's, uh, those of you who aren't as familiar with metric, which hopefully you are, all, all are, that's about an inch and a half, two inches, somewhere in there. Um, so to do a valid fracture test, test requires something that's like 40 centimeters now, which is like a foot and a half. So something now where your fracture specimen has to be kind of this big hunk of steel. And remember, these fracture tests we want to test in a plain strain state, uh, or in a plain strain state. So we need something that's not only about a foot and a half thick, we need some, uh, a foot and a half tall, we need something that's about a foot and a half thick. So these are actual, people actually for certain applications do these sorts of fracture tests. It's not very common. But for something like building grade steels or ship grade steels, where they need to figure out what this fracture toughness value is, they'll actually try to get these giant, like, tens of foot fracture specimens by foot by foot blocks of whatever steel they're testing and try to do fracture tests on them. And that's, you actually need that size of a specimen in order to do a valid fracture test for these very tough materials. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I I haven't actually seen the test specimen uh, the setups they use. I know that there are people that have done them though, um, and it, from theory the the reason they're doing them like that is is to kind of match this linear elastic fracture mechanics setup um, and get a valid K KC KIC number out. I know it's fun stuff. Okay, um, so I'm going to go back and show a quick example uh, to kind of wrap up some of what we had been talking about the last couple of days. Um, just to take an example on like when a part will fail. Then I'm going to talk about a fun subject uh, called Weibull statistics. So I'll show how this actually, how fracture actually applies to the strength of materials. But first, let's look at an example of when will part will break. So, example, eh. when will a part break? So specifically, I'm going to use a thick walled cylinder. Or thick. Something with a wall thickness T that's equal to one centimeter, uh, a radius that's equal to 20 centimeters. Uh, so this is thick walled cylinder uh, under pressure. So I have a big thick walled cylinder. Uh, and I have some internal pressure here, some internal pressure P. And I want to know if I have a crack, with some A is equal to one millimeter, what pressure will cause this to break? So to throw in some numbers now, let's say we have some sort of a, a mild steel. With a fracture toughness now, uh, K1C, that's equal to 56 MPa root meters. Um, and I'm going to tell you now I'm choosing numbers that are very easy to work with. So <clears throat> I want to figure out how much I can load this thing up to. So this is, um, with very rounded off numbers, uh, 
basically a nitrogen cylinder or an oxygen tank. So any of the any of the big cylinders that you see used for research, around twenty centimeters, around like a centimeter thick wall, and they're thick walled pressure vessels now that are kind of intended to be loaded up to high pressures. And I want to know if there's an internal flaw, if there's a, a pretty moderate sized crack in this thing. What, how much pressure can I load it up to before it's going to blow? So <clears throat> now I know if I, I take my thin walled pressure uh, relationships, which we didn't really cover too much in this class, but I don't necessarily expect you to know. You, you probably saw them sometime in 220, um, CE220. But uh, the pressure now, I want to know the stress uh, in the X x1 and x2 directions so that's if i took a little piece here i know under pressure this thing is going to be going undergoing some uh state of tensile stress as it gets as it loaded up um that stress sigma uh one this the stress along the axis uh is pt pr pr over 2t um, and my stress 2 uh, is PR over T. Now, from our fraction mechanics theory, we know the maximum stress. If I know the maximum size of a flaw, or the maximum size of a flaw, um, then I know, and I know the KIC, I know what far field stress I can apply. So I know my, my critical stress is going to be that K1C over square root pi A, which in this case, if I plug in some of my values, uh, 56 MPA root meters, one over square root of pi times uh, 10 to the minus three meters, this actually ends up being um, something around a thousand MPA. So I chose 56 just because it kind of cancels everything out nice. I think it's like 999.1, but um, when you plug values in. So now I know this is the critical stress that will cause failure. I need to know what pressure internally will cause this thing to blow now. So I can plug in now. I know if my sigma 1 is equal to sigma C um, then this is, this goes to uh, PR over 2T is equal to 1000, or P is equal to 2T over R times 1000, which T is 1 centimeter, R is 20 centimeters. This is something on the order of 100 MPA. If now I look at the other one, sigma 2 is equal to sigma c. This goes to pr over t is equal to 1,000. p equals t over r times 1,000, which is actually equal to 50 MPA. So now what this means is actually, remember this is stress in two different directions. So now what I actually have to consider is whether my crack, whether that one millimeter crack is oriented vertically along the specimen or if it's oriented horizontally along the specimen. Because if it's oriented horizontally, it's the sigma one stress that's going to be acting on it. Um, if it's oriented uh, vertically, then it's the sigma two stress that's going to be acting on it. So depending on which way it's oriented, I can either apply a 50 or 100 mil MPA load um, and kind of as a, as a safe working load, you would normally keep it <coughs> at 50 MPA just if you didn't know the exact orientation. Um, there's actually also mixed mode fracture that we're not going to get into too much here um, or at all, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but this is kind of a quick application of that sigma C critical uh, if you know what the, what the internal flaw sizes are. Um, as a reference, 
our most nitrogen tanks, most of those cylinders are loaded up to about 15 MPa. Um, so like most, most industrial gas cylinders, about 15 MPa of load. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a quick example of how, if you know some of the material properties of this thing uh, for a given setup, you can figure out what stresses you can apply to your system before failure is going to happen, if you know what fracture strengths are. <coughs> okay. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Questions so far? All right. So now I'm going to actually ask a conceptual question if my computer wants to start. So say I have two ropes, one long and one short, uh, and I'm hanging a weight off of the end of both of them. The weight is in, it's an equal weight, uh, I can ignore the weight of the rope uh, contributing to it, so they're both uh, basically getting the same applied stress to them. The strain is slightly different because the lengths are different, but the same stress internally in the ropes. So conceptually, which rope is going to fail first? Five more seconds and then, well, it looks like every strong majority are choosing long rope. So, how about you turn to your neighbor and kind of explain your rationale for why you chose long rope? together. <coughs> so what were some of the things you all talked about? I think everyone had the same idea of like, longer rope is more likely to have flaws. Longer rope is more likely to have flaws. <coughs> same yeah. general idea everywhere. Cool. Any other ideas about why the longer rope may be weaker? Okay. Cool. So Yes. Have you, have you all seen this one before? Is this uh, or is this just maybe too intuitive? I think we've seen yeah. similar similar things. Uh, not this exact, but okay. If you have a, a longer sample, it's like if you're doing a, a longer sample of full test versus a smaller one, which one's likely to fail first? The longer one's more likely to have a larger, or like more likely to have a, a crack or some defect mm -hmm. that will cause it to fail. Yep. Yep. Cool. So that's yep. That's basically it. So the when you're looking particularly at brittle materials, you have to think about which one to be, which one is going to have the largest flaw in it. And yeah, statistically, a longer rope is going to have more larger flaws if you assume an equal distribution of flaws in the rope. So this was actually an experiment that was done by Leonardo da Vinci with steel wires. So he hung 
masses from steel wires and tried to see which one would break first um, and found that longer wires were more likely to break earlier um, or at lower applied loads. So um, this is actually, so I think in, in the 1950s, um, there's a guy that came along uh, who kind of explained this phenomena in materials. Um, and it was a guy named Weipel, who's I think Swedish. So this, we can quantify that idea, that kind of intuitive concept using statistics under this idea of Weibull statistics. And so the idea is, say, I mean, I think you all kind of have it. Um, if I have a chain with a whole bunch of links in it, the probability of failure of the chain, P failure of chain is equal to the probability of failure of one link. So if there's any one link in my chain that fails, my chain is, is failed because everything, all the links hold each other together. So in a brittle material, if you have one critical flaw size that's going to cause deformation to happen, that flaw, when it propagates through the material, will cause the whole material to fail. So it's, this is also sometimes known as, as a weakest link theory. Um, weakest link theory. Or that failure is going to happen at the weakest point in our sample. And statistically, that's going to happen. Um, it's, it's going to be more likely for larger materials. So specifically for brittle materials, the probability of failure um, for brittle materials, uh, probability of failure is the probability that you have some crack A that's greater than your critical crack length. So if there's some, so there's, there's always going to be some internal defects in your sample. If you have some defect in your sample that's higher than that AC, where remember um, our AC from fracture mechanics is that one over pi uh, KIC over far field applied stress squared. If I have some A that's greater than that AC value, then failure is going to happen. So um, there's, so I, I, on the, on Canvas, I'll link a paper, or yeah, I've linked a paper to the original paper by, by Weibel on this. Um, but basically he says, all right, there's some, if there's some distribution of flaws in the material, some distribution G of A that's equal to some um, G naught A over A naught to the lambda, um, actually minus lambda, what this looks like is I can kind of define any distribution using this sort of an exponential function. So where this is now my G, so this is a, a flaw density, uh, and this is some A. A naught is some reference, G naught is some reference. Um, but what I want to find is all of the flaws that are greater than that length A, or the greater than that critical length A. And so all of these flaws are going to cause failure. So I want to find probabilistically what's the likelihood that there is some flaw in there <coughs> that's bigger than AC. So um, there's there's some math that goes into this and some, some derivations. Um, using, basically, you, you take this G and you integrate it um, over the volume of your sample and you integrate it over the, the probability density of your A. Um, you can reorganize some stuff and you end up with, uh, I'm just gonna give you the final, uh, the failure probability if given a certain far field stress and given a certain volume of the sample. So this is, um, applied stress and specimen volume. Um, 
this is equal to now some exponential function, exp minus v over v naught, sigma over sigma naught to the m, where sigma naught is some mean um, mean failure stress uh, and v naught is the volume for finding sigma naught. So what this looks like is basically with this exponential distribution if I started testing out a whole bunch of samples. So this is particularly relevant for something, I think the, the place I see it most commonly is carbon fiber composites. So carbon fiber itself, individual carbon fibers are brittle, the high strength brittle materials. And so what you can do is if you do a whole bunch of tension tests on, on hundreds and hundreds of carbon fiber samples, you can see basically the how many survive at a given applied stress. So, so for brittle material, many uh, samples, or I guess how many samples fail at given applied stress. And so what this looks like, what this ends up looking like is I have some, my failure probability, my F here. Oh, this, this is still, there we go. That's still all on the screen. Okay, um, I know at, at very low applied stresses, there'll be nothing, nothing will have failed. At some point, I'll start getting some failures happening at a, at a low stress. And as I, as I keep increasing that applied stress, eventually more and more and more specimens will fail until I hit a failure density of one. So one being all of the specimens will have failed. And so I get this sort of, uh, this sort of an S-shaped, let's do that, there we go. Um, I get this sort of an S-shaped curve. Um, what I can do is take that data, if I say now, I want to reorganize some stuff. Um, if I say, move some stuff over, so one minus, or F, yeah, one minus my F would be this exponential. One over my F would be uh, now the positive version of that exponential, uh, of V over P naught, sigma over sigma naught, to the m. Um, and if I take now a natural log and another natural log of 1 over 1 minus f, I'm basically going to end up with um, natural log of v over v naught plus m natural log of sigma over sigma naught. If I then plot this out, so if I take this data, reorganize it, or recalculate some stuff, and I plot now my natural log of natural log of 1 over 1 minus f, 1 over my failure probability, versus my stress, my uh, natural log of stress. What I'll end up with is all of these failure points. Oh, yeah, sorry. What I'll end up with is all of these failure points will lie along a single line, and that line will have a slope m. So that M now is is my Weibull modulus. M Weibull modulus. And this basically defines how how at what stress distribution samples will fail at. So if I have if I have a low M, a low Weibull modulus, then I have a broader broader stress at failure, a broader, broader num a wider distribution of stresses at failure. If I have a high 
um, this is a narrower distribution of stress at failure. Um, as a reference, something that's high, high M is something greater than 10, and something that's a low M is something less than 5. So in terms of qualities of material, basically you want, you want to be able to very precisely define a failure stress that it's going to, it's going to fail at. As an engineer, you want to say, all right, I know my material is going to, if I apply X amount of stress to it, and if I know that stress state, I know failure is going to happen there. If you have a broader distribution of failure strengths, you have to kind of tail in, so you know, take that lower bound of stress or somewhere in that lower region of stress as your, as your stress bound. Because you know, if, even if I apply a fairly low stress out here, if I apply a fairly low stress out here, there's still a finite probability that I'm going to get failure. Um, there's also one other thing to note. So now, um, if I apply higher stresses, there's higher probability of failure. But also, if I have higher volume, if my volume increases, there's a higher probability of failure. So as, as my V increases, F increases. So this is how uh, statistically that, that kind of conceptual idea of if I have a longer rope, it'll fail first. If I have a bigger sample, it'll fail earlier. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, so, so sigma naught here would be uh, generally it's defined as the stress where half of your samples have failed. Sigma naught, um, but finding that stress, you need to find half of your samples have failed. You you find it for a particular size specimen. Thank you. Um, so that. So I find the sigma naught. This v naught is the volume the volume of my specimen when I find when I find this sigma naught. And so um, there's actually a fun tool. Fun fun is a relative term. An interesting tool. Um, that's on the Wolfram de de demonstration project. So. For those of you who don't know Wolfram Alpha, do all of you know Mathematica? Is everyone familiar with that? Okay, and you all know Wolfram Alpha, or heard of it? Okay, it's it's like Google does more math for you. They can do derivatives and integrals and agglomerate data and present stuff. Uh, Stephen Wolfram is a is a very smart guy, but uh, they have this cool. So Weibull statistics is such a common thing that they actually took. Um, this is data, I guess, from from a mix of uh, liter from a mix of books. I think mostly textbooks that are out there, uh, and they took this and plotted it all actually as an interactive tool where you could play with the Weibull modulus and the value of critical stress sigma naught. So now for different materials, so sigma silicon nitride, for example, this is that distribution of probability of failure and critical stress. I don't, can, you, can you read that on the bottom there a little bit? I, I, I'll post this to Canvas so you can go play with it too. But this is this is that F, and this is my my stress. So probability of failure F and critical stress, um, and I can basically play with different values of Weibull modulus. And you see, <coughs> for higher Weibull moduli and for lower Weibull moduli, it kind of rounds out that curve. And now for higher values of stress and lower values of stress, um, basically if I had a high High sigma naught and a low Weibull modulus. I have a huge distribution of failure probabilities. Yeah. What are the, dots? the dots are experimental data. So, so this this pink line is that fit that is that one minus exponential of, of the thing, and this this is that Weibull modulus parameter m and your stress sigma naught. So now you can basically play around with this until you can that theory line. To your experimental data. And that's how you figure out what your m value is. What your m and what your sigma are. So, uh, what you would do is, is take a log of both plots, uh, take a log of both the data, and, and fit a line to that 
to the logarithm to the logarithm to figure out what that m is. But this is kind of you can also just play with these little sliders and see approximately what what good m's and what good sigma naughts are. Um, so this one has a relatively high Weibull modulus, so something on the order of like 13, 14 that fits well. I don't know if you can actually see this number here at the top at all, um, but again, you can play with this later. It'll be posted to Canvas. Um, but for something like tungsten carbide, um, this actually has higher strengths, so that silicon nitride. Um, the stress that I had was somewhere around if it wants to bounce back. Timed out. Oh, come on. Damn it. So that silicon nitride mean stress was somewhere around 900 something. Um, tungsten carbide is actually. Oh, come on. You can do it. There we go. Tungsten carbide actually has a higher stress, a higher average stress, or a higher average strength of the material, but it has a super low Weibull modulus. So it's a very broad distribution of failure strengths. So this is a Weibull modulus of like five-ish, fits it well, um, as kind of an idea. And so these are all, again, all these blue points are experimental data, and that pink line is, is that Weibull modulus fit to it. So it's not necessarily a perfect way to quantify uh, failure, but it's, uh, and in general, it assumes that so one of the big assumptions you have to make is that you have cracks in the material that don't interact. Technically, if you have two cracks that are close to each other, their stress fields are going to interact and you don't, you don't get that nice LEFM, LEFM solution. Um, but if you have kind of sparse distributions of flaws that don't necessarily interact, Weibull modulus is, is a really good uh, metric for figuring out probabilities of failure. And it's still used, what is it now, 70 years later, pretty regularly. Um, okay. so. Ah, I have like three-ish minutes. Um, so just real quick, in the lab today, or in the lab this week, you'll be doing Sharpie impact tests on steel and aluminum samples. So this is basically showing you the energy it takes to fail a sample. So it's not exactly your K1 or your G, um, but it's, it's the total energy it takes to break something. So you'll take a little rod specimen, I think a 5 16 there'll be a notch in it, and it'll, you have a drop tower that'll come in and just kind of whack your specimen, and it'll break into two pieces. So you'll be able to see now then the fracture surface of the material, something that, <coughs> something that has a higher fracture strength um, will have a more jagged surface, because it'll take more energy to break all those bonds apart, and something that has a lower fracture strength, more brittle, will just have a nice clean break in the middle. Um, and specifically, you'll be looking at how temperature affects that ductile, uh, affects that toughness or that energy absorption. So it's an interesting experiment. It's worth seeing. Uh, there'll be a lab handout in, in the lab that Serwin will give to you. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone.